All right. So everybody hears me? Yeah, I can hear you fine. All right. Good. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming to the Honey Great Lakes program. Uh, prepared and presented by Sedan and offered by the Pontiac Public Library. Sedan is an author and a weird travels journalist. She researches the paranormal, cryptozoology, and the historical events. So, Sedan, it's all yours. And thank you for coming today. Oh, thank you very much for having me come present. Um, uh, in the day and age of Zoom presentations, uh, it's uh, technology is sometimes our friend, sometimes our enemy, um, but we'll try to make it work. So um, if it cuts out at all, please just um, send us a chat so that we know, and I'll try to remember where we cut out and start over from there. Um, so once again, I am Shatia Noir. I am a Paranormal investigator. I am a cryptozoologist. I also write about weird travels, which is uh, haunted locations, um, anything that has to do with uh, you know your your outside the norm um, locations. So uh, anything with uh, old um, Native American sites. Um, the different burial mounds, stuff like that. Um, that's what I love to go research and, and write about. So I also teach uh, courses at two different colleges. I teach a class at Kellogg Community College here in Michigan at both the Battle Creek and Hastings um, campuses. And that is a three-week course that is on legends and folklore of the Great Lakes, um, which is a, a, um, a more um, filled out version of this presentation where I talk about more um, of the unique weird things that happen on the Great Lakes or have happened on the Great Lakes throughout history. I also teach at Owens Community College down in Perrysburg, Ohio. And I teach, uh, the paranormal history of the Great Lakes there, but also a course on uh, cryptozoology of North America. So what I thought I, what I, thought I would start out uh, today's discussion with is um, one that I get asked a lot of questions about, and it's of the ghost ships that we have here on the Great Lakes. So there is a difference between ghost ships and hoodoo ships. Um, I'll talk about hoodoo ships next. So a ghost ship is a ship that has wrecked um, at some point in time on the Great Lakes having sightings of it. So ships that would fall in this category would be the Griffon, uh, LaSalle's ship, uh, the Ralph Simmons, the Christmas tree ship. Um, these are two very well-known ghost ships. Um, the Bananock Burn, um, falls under this category also. So um, each one of these ships has a little bit different history. And I like to, you know, give them, you know, each, you know, their details. And so we'll start with the, the Griffin. So the history of the Griffin is she was built uh, near Niagara Falls by LaSalle. And he went into great debt building this ship. And really it was an odd ship to be built for the Great Lakes because of its construction. Um, many thought she was much too heavy to navigate the different water systems and river systems. And this is a boat that you have to remember, they actually towed across land to get it into one of the Great Lakes so that they could navigate um, through the waterways and make their way up uh, into the Lake Michigan area. So. Basically, they went from the Lake Ontario area through Lake Huron over the Mackinac Straits into Lake Michigan. And they were their prime target was the Wisconsin side because they thought that there would be, be better fur trading along those routes. So he and his men, um, they set forth on this journey. Now, it should be noted that the Native Americans thought that this big ship on the water was an atrocity. Um, they thought, you know, for sure that it was going to draw the anger of the water gods, the underwater spirits like Anabishu, um, Carcagna, 
Onir, um, lake monsters of, of, of these sorts. And they, you know, they thought for sure that if uh, a storm didn't take down the ship, that one of the lake monsters would. But nevertheless, uh, LaSalle and his men did reach the Wisconsin side of Lake Michigan. They did a lot of trading. Um, some estimates said that they had about, um, I believe it was 30,000 um, animal pelts, which is quite a bit of weight. But in the Native Americans' eyes, this would have been greed. And one of the quickest ways to have your ship um, pulled underwater, according to the Native American tribes, was to act in greed. So if you took more than what you personally needed or your tribe needed, then this gave the great underwater panther permission to take your ship and to take you. Um, so if somebody had more copper than they needed, more um, tobacco, more grains than they needed, more iron, um, the legend says that, you know, the great underwater panthers would come and uh, take your ship because you were acting in greed and you were taking more than you needed. So La LaSalle and his, his ship, the Griffin, definitely embodied this because they were loaded down with pelts, with um, some lumber, uh, all different kinds of stuff. And so the story goes that LaSalle and half of his crew parted with the ship and we're going to set up trade routes, um, working their way back towards um, the, the Michigan side of Lake Michigan. Um, so they, they decided that they would all meet back up with um, the ship, the Griffin, around the St. John Rivers area. So the, the ship parted with them now, we do know that it, it did make it into um, the bay along uh, um, the Upper Peninsula um, near Escanaba because there was a Native American hunting party that sheltered in the same bay with them and, you know, was, was trying to tell them, you know, you don't want to go out in one of these storms. It will certainly take down your ship. And so... We do know that the Native Americans, you know, did communicate with them and were sheltered in the same bay as them. But what we don't know is what happened to the Griffin after that. Um, she is sank and resting on the bottom somewhere um, along that route from the Upper Men Peninsula down into Lake Huron. We just don't know where. And with her being a wooden ship, um, chances are that she has deteriorated to probably just the strongest um, uh, planks and boards left in the ship. Um, certainly the, the animal pelts would have deteriorated by now um, because Lake Michigan and Lake Huron uh, are not that deep, as deep as Lake Superior where you have the refrigeration effect and really nothing deteriorates down there. So we really don't know what happened to the Griffin. Um, other than the fact that she probably sank um, and probably sank during the storm that she was trying to shelter from uh, because they tried to leave uh, the safety of the harbor uh, too soon. So another ghost ship that we're going to talk about is the Brow Simmons, which is the Christmas tree ship. Now, the Brow Simmons wasn't the only Christmas tree ship. That term applied to any ship that was trying to make the end of the season runs from the Upper Peninsula of Michigan down into Wisconsin, Chicago area to deliver Christmas trees. But the reason the Rouse Simmons is so famous is because she had a very um, uh, beloved captain and Captain Schumer, and he had gained the nickname of Captain Santa because one of the things that he would do is when he came into port, uh, he would set aside a certain portion of the Christmas trees for low income families. And oftentimes he would either sell the trees for 50 cents or he would give them away free to the different uh, families. So this endeared him to a lot of uh, the different families in the different ports that he would uh, deliver Christmas trees to. And 
he would come sailing into into the the bays, into the ports, um, to the piers and docks with a Christmas tree on his mast and a sign lit up in Christmas lights saying um, Christmas tree, you know, for sale. And so he was he was really really loved. Now the Ralph Simmons as she was employed as a Christmas tree, she was really past her prime. And even the crew was starting to object to how many runs they were making and how much um, of the, the lumber and uh, Christmas trees that they were bringing on to the ship because many of them didn't think she could actually handle it. And actually um, on her last voyage, the voyage that she went lost, uh, several of the crew did not want to board her because they, they could see that she was taking on some water and they really didn't think that she was going to make it. So as they made their way down the coast, we know that she made it to at least one port because there is a story that um, I was told by a, um, another person who is very interested in the Christmas trees ships and the story goes that two of the crew members they got into their their home our port and they still wanted to make their money but the weather was just turning really really bad and they didn't really have um storm weather clothing or winter so they they pleaded with the captain hey it'll only take us 15 minutes to run home grab some heavier warmer clothes we'll be right back and you know, we'll, we'll be right back on the ship and we just want to get some warmer clothes. And so finally he said, okay, fine. So they get to the dock, the two men leave, they get a, they get a taxi cab. Now as fate would have it, this uh, taxi cab driver did not really know the roads um, of, of the city very well. So it took them over 45 minutes to get to their house, get their clothing, and then get back to the Ralph Simmons. By this time, as they get, uh, as they get to the, uh, the pier, they see that the Ralph Simmons has already left port and she's out in the bay already. So they survive the fate of the Ralph Simmons, but they lose all the money that they were going to gain um, because sailors typically didn't get paid for these runs until at the very end of the season when when the ship was you know in her docking and she wasn't going anywhere you know for the rest of the season so after that we do know that a, a brutal winter storm came along and not only did the Ralph Simmons um meet her fate on the lakes but also um three other ships met their fate in um the gen in the same area as the storm was hitting. And that is, um, there's a ship called the Two Brothers that went down, the Three Sisters, and then I believe the North Shore. Um, all of them were lost and it's very tragic that, uh, you know, they, they were lost. Um, but the, the storms that come across the Great Lakes, the gales, um, the blizzards, they, they, they show no mercy. And so the story goes that the lighthouse keeper, um, spotted them you know floundering in the water he did send a rescue ship a you know a um motorboat to to give aid but by the time that the motorboat got to the last known location of the ralph simmons she was gone and so a lot of people will say well if the crew was still on the ship and they were within viewing distance of the water, why didn't they just, you know, jump off the ship and make a swim for it? The problem is, is when you have any type of lumber or Christmas trees or anything like that, that's lashed to the deck and they become loose and now they are floating in the water. Essentially, these are battering rams now and they are battering the ship. They are battering anybody who gets into it. So really your choices are go down with the ship or, uh, be um, destroyed by these Christmas trees that are floating on you know the surface and getting slammed into those, getting slammed into the rocks. Really, you're and um, we do know that the uh, lifeboat that was on the ship had washed away during one of the storm, you know, one of the waves that hit it. So um, they were really at the mercy of 
Lake Michigan, um, who is very well known for her temper tantrums and um, how she, you know, behaves during storms. So every once in a while on a foggy day um, or when the weather is just turning bad, people will claim to see this very derelict ship with some Christmas trees on it um, being seen uh, floating in and out of the mist. And most maritime um, skippers, sailors, you know, captains will tell you when you see something like that, that's your cue to get off the lake as fast as possible because it's giving you a warning. Um, generally within enough time that you can make land and you can avoid the storms. So our next ship um, that I'm going to talk about, that's a ghost ship um, and that there's at least one, uh, you know, good report of uh, an interaction with it is a ship called the Bananock Burn. Now this ship was a pretty big ship. It was, it was actually a freighter. Um, the only issue with it was piling it at this time was a captain of 18 years old. And most of, or he, maybe he was 21, but the crew was between the ages of 18 and 21. Because back in that time period, that was perfectly acceptable to hand over uh, the, um, the captain title to a ship that huge to somebody uh, with not a lot of experience. So we do know that the Bananock Burn um, on the last day that she was known to sail was spotted by several different captains as they were going along the northern portion of Lake Superior. Um, towards the Canadian side. She was viewed coming in and out of fog banks and seeing as this was typical um, weather for Lake Superior at that time, nobody thought anything of it. It wasn't until she didn't make port for several days that people started to suspect that something else was going on and that the Bananock burn pretty much met her fate. So with keeping that in mind and not really knowing where she went down, it said that there is a ship that is the, um, it was a steamer ship, the Walter Riley, and it was trying to avoid a storm. So they were sticking close to landfall, um, the shorelines. And this shoreline happened to have lots of rocky crags, um, rock outcroppings. Um, so you didn't want to go too close to the shoreline, but you wanted to at least give you and your crewmen a fighting chance if uh, the waves did overtake your ship that you could launch a lifeboat and try to make it to landfall. Um, so as they're progressing along this uh, stretch of coastline, they suddenly realize there's another ship bearing straight down on them and it's coming at them full force. And so the very panicked um, uh, captain of the Walter he, he breaks his course. He decides he's going to go more out into the lake and doesn't know what this other captain's problem is, but they're headed straight towards them. So they, they do, you know, avoid collision. They, they go out into the lake and they're like, wow, I don't know what his problem was. He could clearly see us. And as the ship passes by, they're like, that ship really looks familiar, but they couldn't quite place it. And it, it, you know, kind of disappears behind them into the fog. And they're like, well, uh, you know, more power to them. Hopefully they can avoid the rocks and the storm. So by this time, the captain of the Walter decides he's going to navigate back into the route that he was originally taking. And he, he's going to go closer to the, you know, shoreline. And they, they are on this course for, you know, not more than a, a half an hour. And suddenly the same ship is coming at them again. And now the captain of the Walter is, is really freaked out because there's no way in this wave activity, this storm, that that other ship could have made a complete circle around them, got far enough in front of them fighting the waves and is coming straight back at them. So once again, they, they take the ulterior course, they, they come back out into the lake. And this time as the ship passes by them, they can clearly read on the side of it the Bananock burn. And so they watch as the ship disappears behind them and then they hear a, what they described as a bunch of explosions. 
So the thought is that the Benenock burn sank somewhere in that location, and they were trying to uh, push, you know, the the other ship off course so that they wouldn't meet the same fate and would not wreck on the rocks that they couldn't see, um, which is a a issue with any of these. Uh, there's a, uh, lots of different anomalies on the Great Lakes um, lake bottoms with different rock outcroppings coming up. And as long as the water's you know, calm, you can probably sail over top of them and never know it. But when you have the, wa the waves dipping down like this, it will smash a ship down onto um, any of these rocky outcroppings and your ship um, it, you know, becomes another casualty of like the pinnacle of doom or the um, other, um, the shoals, you know, these different um, areas. So those are the three um, ghost ships that I like to discuss the most. Now, we also have, because I, I, I know people are probably wondering, well, what about the Edmund Fitzgerald? Well, the Edmund Fitzgerald actually, for me, falls under a different class. And there's, there's um, two that I, I discuss in this this class of hoodoo ships. Edmund Fitzgerald is one of them. And a hoodoo ship essentially is a ship that has had more tragedies to her than what any uh, good-minded sailor wants to step foot on. So with the Edmund Fitzgerald, um, legend says that within her launching, um, she had her three strikes against her with um, first they couldn't launch her. And uh, she was, they, they were having a hard time removing the blocks from underneath of her. And then when she did launch, she almost capsized. Uh, that was like one and two. And then the third one, when they went to break the bottle, um, usually it's a champagne bottle. Uh, when they went to smash the champagne bottle and, and break it to toast her, uh, it didn't break. And it took three more times for it to break. And at this point, a lot of old sailors are going, no, nope, we don't add anything with this ship. And then the third was when she almost capsized a person in the audience um, who was observing it, because back in that time period, la ship launchings were huge ordeals. The whole uh, town turned out because it was a spectacle to see. Um, at least one person had a heart attack while she was launching. And this is like just, you know, she hasn't even gotten on the water yet. She's got three strikes against her. So throughout her history, she was famous, absolutely famous for um, having the most productive runs, uh, you know, fastest times, biggest cargo deliveries. Uh, but she did also have some other issues with, she got stuck in the Sioux locks at least three times, um, which is very aggravating for anybody, uh, other ship captains, because now they have to wait uh, to make their deliveries. Um, we do know that she also lost her anchor near Detroit. And of course, her her final um, her end song was being lost during that uh, horrible gale, and um, you know being uh, at the mercy of, of the storms. Um, now we're not quite sure what exactly took her down. I'm a fan of the three sisters theory, which is um, three waves hitting one after another. Um, first one being about twenty feet. Next one's 40 foot, next one's 60 foot. So by the time the 20 foot wave is cresting and breaking over the ship, this 40 foot wave is coming down on top of her. And we do know that her cargo holds were not completely sealed. So this water just rushes in there and this starts to make her tip forward. And then the 60 foot wave would hit and that would send her even deeper under the water. So at a certain point as she's filling with water and being pushed nose down, uh, you have to remember that the propellers were still going. And this, when she does get underwater, completely drives her right down into lake bed. Now, this happened very, very quickly because the ship behind her that was actually acting as her radar, because her radar, the Edmund Fitzgerald's radars were lost, um, they were acting as her, her radar. And the last report they, they got from the captain, uh, McSorley, was that we're holding our own, and then she was gone. So um, 
some thoughts are that the admin was actually was actually driving herself into the the, of the seabed as um, the other ship, um, the MacArthur, was sailing over top of where she went down. Um, every attempt was made to to try to find out where she went. We all, we now know. Um, that her final resting place is on the bottom. That is her final resting place. Um, the families don't want anything else brought up. Um, there were human remains found with the Edmund Fitzgerald, which makes her a maritime uh, graveyard and is protected under state and federal law. Um, so the Edmund Fitzgerald, for all of her might, all of her glory, um, it really didn't matter in the end because the Lake Superior still took her. And there's a reason why they say that Lake Superior never gives up her, her dead. And case in point, we will talk about the ship, the Kamloops, um, because the Kamloops is actually in a very deep body of um, Lake Superior. And... Uh, marine archaeologists who have gone down and surveyed the wreck to make sure that it's not going to be smashed by anybody's anchors, um, anything like that, have gone down and the, the ship is perfectly preserved because the water is so cold, it's like being in a deep freeze. So really there's no organisms that are feeding on the metal of the ship. Um, it'll probably still be there 100 years from now. But the eerie thing about this is that there is a human remain, a actual body left on the ship. Because of the cold depths, he does not deteriorate. But what he does do is his corpse follows you around the ship as you uh, swim through it. Now, this is a very deep depth of water. It's a technical drive. It's not a dive. It's not a recreational. So really, you have to know what you're doing uh, to go down this deep. And so you can imagine as you're, you're swimming with your scuba gear through this shipwreck and suddenly um, this corpse comes swimming after you. It's actually floating, but the wake that you make as you're swimming through the ship activates him and gets him moving around. Now, they don't, they're not quite sure who he is, but he has earned uh, two nicknames of Grandpa and Old Whitey. Um, so, you know, that just shows you, um, you know, some of the interesting things about our, our Great Lakes, especially Lake Superior, with the preserving fact that there is a body that went down probably 100 years ago. Um, or more and is still completely intact because of where they went down in the, the lake bed and the coldness. Now, I'm also going to talk about a ship that um, was uh, notorious and that ship is the Eastland. Now the Eastland was known for having problems with her balance. Um, before the great tragedy in Chicago, she had almost capsized once before. Uh, she had lots of balance issues and she didn't last very long with, with many owners. Everybody would, you know, they'd buy her, realize how many issues she had, and then they'd sell her off really fast. But on this occasion, um, she was hired to transport uh, a factory full of workers. They, this was their... Um, uh, like employee um, celebration day. And they were going from the Chicago area over to um, the sand dunes on the Michigan side of Lake Michigan for a picnic and stuff like that. So a lot of people didn't know um, who weren't directly related to the ship or having experiences with the ship that she was um, had all these issues. So being a newer ship, everybody wanted to go on the Eastland. So unfortunately, everybody started boarding the ship. Everybody wanted a rail side um, viewing point. So everybody rushed to the far side of the ship, which started getting her to tip. Now the engineer in, in the ship is trying to flood the, the ballast tanks to keep her, you know, stable. Unfortunately, as people start to realize that they're, they're rushing too much to the one side of the ship, they start rushing back to the other side of the ship. 
now this gets her going. Now we're not talking like 10 people. We're talking about a thousand people rushing from one side of the ship to the other, which gets her going in a rocky motion. And, uh, and in no time flat, she's capsizing. And so um, over 800 people died because of this. Uh, there were so many people who were lost that the local morgues, um, hospitals, uh, police stations, fire departments had no room for the bodies. So any warehouse, any building um, was where they, they store these bodies. And this was back in the day when um, telephones were still, you know, not every household had one. Um, you know, it, it was a lot of, um, you know, word of mouth and stuff like that. So the sad thing is, is a lot of people, um, they had to go through the employee directories and find out who the, you know, who each employee was and who their family members out of town or out of state were, because the assumption was if, if Fred, you know, if Fred Smith was on the ship that day chances are his wife and children were on the ship also and died so they had to contact next of kin who are out of state or out of town uh to come in and identify the bodies and so you know these bodies you know were sitting for quite a while at least a week or so um, before somebody was able to come and identify them and actually you know give them a, a name and, and then be able to take the body and, and properly, you know, do a burial um, and ceremony for it. So um, really the Eastland, um, her story doesn't end there either because they are able to write in her and then she's sold off to another owner who decides to take her out on, uh, I believe they sell her to the US government. She's transported to a different location and essentially she's used as target practice um, until she's you know no longer waterworthy and then they just leave her to the elements. So um, this ship had a bad history uh, of issues with you know um, you know that put human lives really in danger, and it wasn't until you know the very last tragedy with her capsizing that um, you know. Pretty much everybody said that's a bad ship. That's a hoodoo ship, and uh, nobody, you know, th this ship was hated after that. Um, nobody wanted to deal with it. So it was, it was really, uh, um, I don't want to say justice, but um, she, you know, she did meet her end as she, you know, uh, gave others their end. So you know, that's for ghost ships and hoodoos. Those are the ones that are. Um, the most interesting to me and the ones that I like to talk about um, the most. Now, we can't have um, our Great Lakes without having our lighthouses. And even though most of them are automated at this time or retired, they still, they served a purpose for, for so long um, with trying to warn sailors, trying to uh, just, help save human lives and there are so many different um lighthouses all along the the shorelines of the great lakes that it's it's really um i don't want to say disrespectful but uh it would take me two hours to probably talk about most of them uh, but we do have some that have more activity than others now it's said that uh the port austin Point, Point Off Rocks uh, Lighthouse, which is um, up in, everybody, you know, loves to do this. So it's up in the thumb area. And this is where we have that wonderful land formation called Turn Up Rock that you have to kayak out to. Um, but we also have this lighthouse out there and it is haunted. Now, this is a public um, lighthouse that's been turned into a museum. You can definitely go and spend the day there. Um, uh, you know, kayak out to, to turn up rock, uh, get your pictures, and then, um, you know, get a picnic launch, go a couple of miles down to Point Up Rocks and visit the lighthouse there. It is a, um, it's now a museum and you can explore it. Um, really pretty, you know, rocky coastline that you can check out. 
but it is haunted. Now, the story behind this is the original keepers um, who were stationed there was a husband and wife and their children. Now, as the story goes, at one point, the wife gets very, very sick. So the husband, um, knowing that he can entrust the, the, the lighthouse duties to his, his children, goes into to port to try to get a doctor from uh, the local town so that he can come out and treat you know the wife. So he does and um the they they asked the doctor to stay overnight you know let us make you dinner let's you know um and stay the night and we'll take you back early in the morning and the doctor is is very um uh insistent that he get back you know to his office because he has appointments in the morning and he doesn't want to jeopardize that so Kind of unwillingly, the the lighthouse keeper, you know, they both get into the boat and he's taking him back. As this happens, a storm comes up and both are lost. Now, from that day on, the the wife and the children run the lighthouse, and they do so until her passing, and then the the son and uh, daughter in law take over running, you know, the the lighthouse. Now, it's said that. Every once in a while, people will see a woman dressed in black morning clothes walking along the shoreline with a lantern, or they witness somebody in white clothing in the lighthouse um, moving from room to room. And this is said to be that or original keeper. Um, her husband was the first keeper, and then she assumed the duties of keeper after he passed. And so it's said that she still goes um, about the, the location, trying to find her husband um, in hopes that maybe he will return to her. And so it, it's, um, you know, a very touching story. And it, uh, like I said, you can, you can go publicly and you can, um, you know, go through the lighthouse, you can explore it and it's open to the public. It is a museum. Now on the other side of the state, on the Lakes, uh, Michigan side, we have the White Hall Lighthouse. And this one has gained attention in recent years because there, um, about two years ago, a sh the shipwreck of the, I believe it's the contest, um, was re exposed. Now, this ship had been lost for 75 years under the sands, but suddenly with all the winter storm activity, she was re-exposed and I actually got up to you know, got up there to see her um, before the sand covered her back over. Now, historians, archaeologists, we had no idea of knowing when she would be seen again. But as recently as this year, the, the timbers were uncovered again because of the storm activity, and people were once again able to view her. Now, this lighthouse um, is not. Oops. Can you guys hear me? Yep. Okay, as long as you can, as long as you can hear me. Um, so the White Hall, uh, the White Hall Lighthouse was actually built because of the ongoing commerce and trading routes that were being established. And the original keeper, uh, he was actually very well known for, he would stand during the stormy weather, he would stand on the beach and with a, with a lantern to let people know that that's where um, the mouth of the Whitehall River was. And so after petitioning the town and the local government, finally the lighthouse was built. This keeper, he remained um, there until uh, he was going to retire, and actually he, he died the night that he retired there. Um, it said that him and his wife, uh, their ghosts, are still at that lighthouse, and they, they're actually only buried a thousand feet from the lighthouse, but it said that as uh, people come in, uh, different curators come in because this is also a lighthouse that's a museum. As people come in and are walking around, occasionally people will see him in the mirror um, on the second floor. 
But the most interesting thing is if one of the curators is dusting or, or cleaning the glass or anything uh, in the museum and they get distracted or pulled away, when they come back, all the dusting and cleaning has been done and the um, cleaning supplies are not where they left them. They, they have been you know, moved to a different location. So it's thought that the, um, the lighthouse keeper and his wife are still maintaining the lighthouse as of you know um you know modern times and they still take pride in it and still want it to be preserved so that's a you know that is on the other side of, of the state um, in uh, whitehall michigan right there on the coastline um and if you're lucky enough if, this, if the the waves and wind have been active enough you if you go to that lighthouse you might be able to see the shipwreck that is right there on the shoreline. Um, it just depends on if it's buried with sand or you know if it's uncovered. Um, another interesting lighthouse is uh, Shishwa Lighthouse, which is is not pronounced the way it, it's spelled. Um, it's a very interesting uh, spelling, but this is actually a modern, a more modern day um, ghost story in the effect that the curator um, was summoned to the property one night because the alarm system kept on going off. And so of course she calls you know, the, the, the police, they show up and they go building by building and turning off all the different alarm systems and making sure that nobody's in the buildings. Now, weeks prior to this, somebody had broken into the gift shop and had pretty much smashed open the door and they, they stole um, like the cash box and, and items that were of value. And so they were, they were kind of, you know, predicting that this was happening again. So they get there, they check all everything and there's nobody None of the buildings have been broken into, but the alarm systems are going off. So they check each alarm system and make sure that it's, it's you know, functioning properly, properly, that there's nobody in the buildings. And she she tells the police, well, I'll call the security company in the morning and have them come out and check. So the police leave and she's like, hmm, I'm going to do one more, you know, walk around, make sure um, that, you know, everything's, you know, set in place. So she does. And as she's pulling, you know, out of the parking lot and she's headed down the road, she notices that there is a slow moving vehicle coming towards her. And she realizes that there are some teenage boys in this vehicle. Now the driver of this vehicle is a very husky, um, big teenager. And it immediately clicks in her brain, uh, you know, that kid looks like he could kick down the door. So she she gets their attention and she pulls up next to him and says, I just want you to know that the security system is working and I've already called the state police back. So the the car of teenagers immediately takes off and um, what she thinks was happening is that the original lighthouse keeper of that lighthouse was setting off the security alarms because he knew that the teenagers were coming to break back in and he didn't want any damage done to his lighthouses or his buildings or the gift shop he didn't want anything taken or stolen so he was setting off the security alarms in hopes that this would draw the curator or the keepers or the police and that somebody would be able to intervene and catch these teenagers in the act and so uh obviously she did and um still to this day they you know whenever the security um alarms get tripped they they thank the, the original lighthouse keeper because they they think that he is the one who was doing it so um you know our, our lighthouses uh served a purpose and they they saved countless lives and there are so many of them um i know that we have the lighthouse festival here in michigan i believe in july um you can probably find it on the pure michigan site 
and really it's a wonderful opportunity to go um, go around and uh, look at all these different lighthouses, you know, take pictures, um, uh, talk to the keepers that are there and get their history. And who knows, maybe you might just have some uh, ghost activity when you, when you go there. So my final subject of the day, um, which I think is, is uh, something I, I can't talk about the paranormal history of the Great Lakes without discussing our lake monsters. And so each one of the, the lakes um, does have its own uh, resident lake monsters. Um, in Lake Michigan, we have two giant turtles that are said to exist. Um, they have been spotted in Stearns Bayou and also Lake Leelanau. And uh, they were witnessed by different groups of people. And I will say that they are two separate turtles as far as description goes. Now, the one that was seen in Lake, uh, or um, in Stearns Bayou was said to have the head of a hippopotamus, was about the size of a Volkswagen bug, and glowed from underneath. But it was a very noisy, um, turtle with the way that it paddled through the water and on two separate occasions it woke up the people um, that were actually staying in the cabin. Now it said that it did come on shore and laid an egg and uh, they did retrieve the egg but as they were taking it by wagon into town as they were crossing the bridge and it was hitting bumps the 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 egg was very leathery and slid out of the person's arm and fell into the river and they were never able to find it again now like leelanau the um, turtle that's there is um a very old turtle because it has uh trees growing up out of the algae on its back. Now, this is also a turtle that's about the size of a rowboat, if not bigger, because the report you know, says that the young man who decided to go fishing that day rode his rowboat out to some trees. And as he was tying his rowboat up to the trees and the rowboat was gently butting against what he thought were root systems, suddenly this head raises up on the water and looks at him. Now about this time, he's pulling the rope loose and falling back into the ship and trying to paddle away. And obviously the turtle's swimming away and he vows that he's never going to go fishing ever again. Um, now, uh, Lake Michigan, the streets of Mackinac actually connect Lake Michigan to Lake Huron. So I, I use um, the next tale as a, um, a tie between of both lakes because really um, the sea serpents that were observed could have gone into either body of water. But this report happened around the 1960s. It was investigated by a deputy sheriff who actually bravely got into a boat himself and rode out to see exactly what these you know creatures were. Now, from people who were on the shoreline, they were reporting seeing sea serpents. Um, large, you know, uh, thick bodied sea serpents that were swimming through the water. They reported seeing at least three of them, but they weren't sure because at times they would duck under the water and then come back up. Um, but at any given time, they were seeing, you know, three to five of them in this area. So when the sheriff deputy comes out and he's investigating, he rows out. As soon as he gets close to the location, uh, all the, the sea serpents duck underwater and he, they are not observed again in that location. So we don't really know where they go from that point, but it is documented that at least a deputy sheriff saw them and observed them and investigated them. Now, um, I always have to talk about Lake Superior because she, uh, Lake Superior is home to the great underwater panther or lynx um and the name of this creature is Inabishu. Now every tribe, uh Native American tribe around Lake Superior, if they had any type of dealings with Lake Superior, they knew this creature. Um in my research I found that Inabishu 
there is actually over 50 different spellings and pronunciations of this creature's name. So for me, I, I had to choose one. So Inabishu is what um, stuck for me. So now this is a creature that um, description wise has a long spiked tail, has the head of a horse with uh, antlers like a, a moose, a slimy seaweed mane and, um, you know, uh, is covered with slimy seaweed. And legend says the, the hooves like a deer, but um, on the back, you know, legs has more um, like uh, flippers like a fish. So the reason I mentioned this description is, and I didn't believe this um, at first, I, I researched it um, for a while before I, I decided, yeah, this made sense. So imagine you're in one of these old canoes that is just above waterline and you are trying to stick close to shore because you don't trust Lake Superior for anything. Um, you've seen what damage she can do. So you're, you're maybe, you know, 15 feet from shore, maybe 20. And as you're paddling along, this huge creature comes bursting out of the water and tries to sink your canoe. So we all have this picture in our head. So it has been documented by biologists um, both uh, marine biologists and uh, moose biologists that moose will dive up to 20 feet underwater to eat underwater vegetation because it has different minerals and, and uh, a different flavor than what they can get on land. And it's not just a, a like once in a while thing. Um, they do this in Alaska, they do this in the Great Lakes, they do this, you know, on the East Coast, the border of Maine. Um, it, it's been documented that they will dive 20 feet underwater because they can seal their noses shut and to grab mouthfuls of this vegetation. And then they, they swim back up to the surface, eat it, and then they dive back down. And so if you're coming around, you know, one of these, uh, um, you know, bends in the, in the lake shore. And all of a sudden this creature pops up, you know, beside you and is thrashing the water and is all slimy and has these horns and, and, uh, you know, tries to attack your canoe, but then dives back down under the water. Well, you're probably not going to stick very long in that location to see what it was. You're going to paddle off as fast as possible. And so this is, I think, part of the legend of Inabishu is uh, moose being in a location that we don't expect them to be in, but they're there. Um, now going down into Lake Huron, we have two creatures. We have uh, Gassendia and we have uh, Carcagna. Now Carcagna has a very uh, famous cal. Um, he's part of the, the Mike Finn um, legends. And it's said that Mike Finn is this um, big burly guy, you know, uh, kind of like Paul Bunyan, um, you know, one of those tall tale figures. And he's in a bar one night bragging with all of his friends that he can beat any monster, he can beat any animal. And a stranger comes forth and says, well, if that's the case, you should have no problem taking on this creature that's coming down through the swamps um, and is headed, you know, towards our port. And Mike Finn says, I'll take care, you know, no problem. I can take care of it. So he rows out into the lake in his rowboat. Now his friends knowing, you know, that he likes to brag, he likes to tell tall tales, line the shoreline because they are positive that at some point Mike Finn's going to paddle back in and he's going to hide on the shoreline and then, you know, make his reappearance in the morning, making his claims, but he never does. And so morning comes and everybody's coming back into town and, hey, have you seen Mike Finn? Have you seen Mike Finn? Nobody's seen him. So as they're waiting on the dock, they do observe a small um, figure on the horizon out on the lake. So one of the gentlemen has a motorboat. So they motor out to the boat and 
people can't from shore, from the piers, they can't see what's going on. So as the motorboat's getting closer and they're actually getting within earshot, they, they start hearing the people in the boat yelling, get the doctors, get the, the doctors. And so as they tie up on the dock, they're like, what happened? They're like, it's Mike. He's, um, there's something wrong with him. So as the doctor gets there and they're pulling Mike Finn out of his boat, he is completely catatonic. He, he is um, just scared out of his mind. And everybody is, is like, oh, what happened? And so one of the people um, get down into his boat and they, they pick up what is a yellow and black, very slimy feather. And that is part of the description of Carcagna is it was a sea dragon, um, not the cute little, you know, seahorse, sea dragons that we see at Queerth, but a, a aquatic dragon um, that had a mane and tail of these slimy yellow and black um, and wings of these slimy yellow and black feathers. And it said that anybody who encountered Carcagna would go insane. And so that is our tale of Carcagna. Um, now in Lake uh, Ontario, we have, um, you know, things like uh, the black dog, um, which is said to um, have been sailing on a ship and the way the waves were rocking so bad that he fell off the ship and instead of the captors and captain and sailors saving the dog it said it was a newfoundland um instead of them trying to save the dog they they were like teasing the dog and and uh and um really uh you know being mean to the dog and the dog finally ended up dro drowning so they go to um move through the the water channel systems the locks and the dams and they can't because the lock is actually blocked by the body of a big black dog now it's said that um this dog will uh determine your fate and so if as you're sailing lake ontario a big black dog uh climbs aboard your ship runs across the deck jumps on into the water on the other side that you need to get out of the water immediately because something bad's going to happen. And so it's said that um, captains have observed the black dog swimming all the way onto the beach and then running off into the sand to disappear. So he's really not a lake monster. Um, he's kind of a, a omen of, of um, you know, the bad weather. And so, but he is associated with Lake Ontario. Um, now Lake Erie um, has a has Bessie. Um, it has a giant sturgeon legend. Um, the interesting thing I want to say about Lake Erie is she is our most shallow body of water, um, with depths uh, you know going not much further than you know um, 480 feet, maybe 500 at, at different points. But it's actually a very shallow body of water as compared to our other Great Lakes. But the interesting thing about Lake Erie is there was a ship called the Bessemer Marquette Number no. Three. This ship was about the size of a football field, a metal ship. It transported um, train cars to different locations. Now, this ship sank in modern times, and this ship has still, to this day, not been found. So if a ship of that size can go missing in Lake Erie, then there is, uh, you can't leave anything out of what is possible on our, our Great Lakes. And so um, having said that, that is uh, the uh, end of my presentation. And if anybody has any questions, um, feel free to ask. I'm gonna grab a, a sip of uh, uh, Sprite for a second. Does anybody have any questions? You've heard some of these stories, but not other ones. Where do you get your info from? A lot of it comes from research into um, books um, 
that were written by uh, Mr. Stonehouse. Um, he's a late time uh, historian. Um, talking to the lighthouse keepers, talking to people uh, who live in the area, uh, different areas. Um, our, our Great Lakes are quite vast, so and they're connected with many different states. So um, just doing a lot of research and um, knowing that historical reports um, that made it into magazine or uh, newspapers at the time, um, generally captains, um, ship captains, ship crews, people who um, lived along the, the lake shores, they don't want to be called crazy. So in order for them to make a report to any of the, the local authorities or magistrates, um, they had to actually be very concerned about what was going on uh, because nobody wanted to be, be labeled crazy, especially a boat captain, because once somebody thought you were drinking um, on the job or you were you know, mentally impaired, you weren't going to pilot anybody's ship at, um, anymore. What was the last? Oh, the Bessemer Marquette number three. Well, that was very interesting, although I don't think the cat was too impressed. <laughs> well, yeah, she is, she's a brat. Uh, I, I tried to capture her and, and put her in a different room, but she was evasive. She's got to have the cleanest paws in the world now. <laughs> I know. I kept on seeing her little legs sticking out from my head. I'm like, oh, man, of all the chairs that you could sit on the back of. Well, thank you. That was interesting. Thank you. You're welcome. So, Dan, I'm checking on Facebook to see if there are any questions. Okay. And uh, at this point, I don't see any comments or questions on Facebook. Okay. Uh, everybody, any more questions? Let me see the chat here. Okay. Oh, there is a, a question from Catherine. Okay. Do any legends exist that the lakes are cursed, thus causing shipwrecks? So really, the if there is any curse to be held to, it's the one from the Native Americans that, that talks about taking more than what you need. And, you know, from early on up until present day that, you know, if you look at all the iron ore, lumber, rain that's been moved across the Great Lakes and how many ships have met their ends um, in the Great Lakes, um, you know, that's a vast number. Uh, you know, ship-wise, we're probably, um, I would say, uh, from the beginning of, of um, men, women, children, uh, you know, crossing the lakes till present day, you're probably looking at a uh, I would say an estimate of uh, around 30 ships of different sizes that have gone down and um, a loss of life into like 60,000. So when you compare that with the Native American, um, you know, curse that says, you know, if you take more than what you need from the Great Lakes, the Great Lakes will, you know, the uh, Inabishu or the water spirits will punish you and take down your ship, that can certainly apply to these different, um, you know, locations. Um, we do have, you know, each one of the Great Lakes um, has at least one Devil's Triangle. Um, now, I don't think that so much as a curse as it is a, a paranormal location where we have some strange activity going on. Um, lakes seem to be a hotbed for paranormal interdimensional um, you know anomalies and with the Great Lakes um, you know we have we have uh, in Lake Michigan it runs from Ludington Michigan over to Manitowoc uh, Wisconsin down to Benton Harbor and then back up along that line 
uh, to Ludington, Lake Superior, there is an area um, on the western uh, part of uh, Lake Superior that runs along the North Shore and comes down into uh, the Upper Peninsula and then runs back across. And then the other one is actually um, very close to where the Edmund Fitzgerald went down and that's actually part of the shipwreck coast of the Upper Peninsula. And there are at least 13 ships sitting on the bottom right there on one side of the peninsula. Uh, the other side of the peninsula, we've got at least eight. And so that is, that location has a lot of um, very bad wave activity and a lot of captains thought they could weather out the storm, um, you know, getting on one side of the peninsula or the other. And sometimes they could, sometimes they couldn't. Now Lake Huron, um, it runs from uh, Alpena down to Point Up Rocks uh, into uh, Saginaw Bay and then back up to Alpena. Uh, Lake Erie, you might as well, uh, it's got what's called a quad angle, but it's basically the whole lake except for like the corner parts. Um, and it, it's just huge. And then Lake Ontario has what's called the Marysburg Vortex um, or Triangle. And it's where they think um, a long time ago, a meteorite with magnetic um, properties crashed into the lake bed and it, it really messes up all the, the uh, ship's navigational um, uh, equipment. There is another question. How about UFO stories? So UFO stories, we do have the classic UFO story um, in association with the Great Lakes where at least one, um, uh, I believe it was a Scorpio um, jet. Uh, it was sent to investigate a uh, UFO and this was Lake Superior um, coming across, um, you know, uh, Sault Ste. Marie, um, the, um, yeah, Sault, wait, Saint, no, Sault Ste. Marie, um, kind of got my locations back. Um, it was right around in that area. And we do know that the uh, fighter jet that went to investigate it was lost. And from what the radar operators could see, the larger ship, which they claimed was the UFO, pretty much absorbed the fighter jet and it was gone. They made every attempt to salvage and to look for um, survivors and they were not able to find anything, um, not even wreckage of the plane. Any more questions? Let me see. I think there are no more questions. Let me check Facebook again. Okay. No, there's no comment there. Okay. Um, thank you everybody for coming. That was extremely interesting. For somebody like me who's coming from a country that uh, um, doesn't have big lakes and rivers, I'm coming from Greece, and uh, when I hear a lake, I think of a small thing 
<laughs> quiet that nothing <laughs> happens to it. And now I, uh, I realize that the lake can be like a sea, these lakes anyways. Yeah, that was oh, extremely yeah. interesting. <laughs> yeah, our, our, Thank our you so much. Yeah, our, our Great Lakes are Thank very you. much like seas. <laughs> yeah. Um, thank you, everybody. Thank you, Shadan. That was amazing. Thank you. Don't forget, we have one more program. Uh, um, Lake Monsters and Odd Creatures of the Great Lakes on August 7th. So we can see you again there. That would be another one. Coming on behalf of the Pony. Hi guys. Hey, thank you. Thank you again.